there for this second part of this week's Talking Europe on France 24. I'm very pleased to be sitting down with Manfred Weber, leader of the biggest group in the European Parliament, the European People's Party. Thanks so much for being with us. Absolutely. Good now, uh, in your home country of Germany, your party is the CSU, which is the, the Bavarian part of Angela Merkel's ruling CDU-CSU union. So I think that brings us quite logically to that upcoming event that's going to be massive, not just for Germany, but also for Europe, the elections in Germany. Angela Merkel is expected to win and become chancellor for the fourth time. What do you think that would mean for Europe? The most important message, first of all, is that there is no debate about Europe, that Germany is part contributing to the European development. Martin Schulz, Angela Merkel, both candidates are clear pro-Europeans. Mm -hmm. So that's a good message for our union. And uh, uh, a next mandate from Angela Merkel will for sure give us the opportunity, together with Macron, to restart the future debate of Europe. So there is all absolutely needed a discussion about deepening the European Monetary Union, so the, Euro, the currency union. Mm -hmm. And we have to talk about uh, defense and external affairs. So there is a need to talk about deepening our union to make it more stronger, to defend the interests of people on a global level. Well, you mentioned there that uh, both Angela Merkel and, uh, and Mr. Schultz are pro-European. That certainly wasn't the case uh, in France for the presidential election, where the majority of candidates were anti-Europe in one way or another. Um, do you think that uh, Angela Merkel would, uh, sh should she win, do you think that she would sort of partner up with Emmanuel Macron to try and reinvent Europe and try and reconvince Europeans that it is a project worth getting behind? The will from both sides is obvious. Macron several times underlined that he wants to combine his forces, his power together with Germany to restart the European process. And Angela Merkel has probably a different kind of style of doing politics, mm. but she's clearly committed to make Europe strong in a globalized world. It's obvious for everybody that we need an European voice to defend our interests. So there is a chance for doing this. But it's again about the details mm -hmm. and uh, Paris and Berlin for sure have uh, with the same headline probably uh, different uh, uh, ideas behind mm -hmm. and that is a negotiation process but that's normal and what is important for us on Brussels level is that it's not only Germany and uh, France who will decide about the future of Europe it's about all of us so the European institutions the European Parliament is a place where the citizens are, are represented must have a key role in the question about the future of the European Union. Now, we know that uh, in the past, Germany uh, and France, in, in, in different ways, have been pushing for more federalism in Europe, really much tighter cooperation. You mentioned yourself, uh, defence, uh, security policy, foreign policy. Uh, there is resistance to this, though, particularly at a time when so many voices are talking about uh, breaking away from the European Union. Is the idea of this closer integration perhaps an enormous gamble? Well, it makes people a little bit afraid because when we always talk about more and more Europe, Europe is far away from people's daily life that mm. we must have in mind. So the national level and the local level is much more closer to citizens and we should recognize this as European politicians. That's why we shouldn't talk about more and more Europe, we should talk about a better Europe. We should mm -hmm. talk about where we need Europe. And when, when, we, talk cities, when we talk with citizens, uh, towards the question of defence, having Putin in mind, having the uncertainty all, all around Europe in mind, then people understand that it's better to combine our forces, to do it together and to, uh, to, have, uh, to, ha to, to, to save also money because it's cheaper for the investments if we do this together. I'll give you one concrete example, cyber security mm -hmm. and internet. It's so obvious for everybody that it's better to do one cyber defense unit inside of the European Union where we have the best experts on one table to defend our European internet structure than to do it with 28 member states. It's much more cheaper and more effective. And that's, that is exactly what we need on concrete points, not theoretical debate about institutions and structures. Let's really solve problems. Now, uh, coming back to the election in Germany itself, uh, the far right is seen as gaining in popularity, particularly in, in certain parts of eastern Germany. Uh, do you predict that the far right is going to make a great advance uh, come September 24th? Well, let's see. It's uh, up to the voters to decide this. But the risk is there. So the left, the Linke in Germany, and the far right, the AFD, are uh, growing for the moment in the polls. Uh, nobody knows what happens really on, on Sunday then, on the election day, but they are growing for the moment and that is a big point of concern. Even having in mind that Germany is economically doing very well, 
that the populists are going up. That's why I would say, as a clear pro-European, uh, in the centre, uh, uh, working politician, I would say the fight against populists is not over, even having the big victories in France, for example, in mind. But the fight against them is not over. We have to defend the European project. Well, yes, uh, some people would even argue, in fact, the fact that uh, Marine Le Pen made it into the second round of the presidential election in France uh, was far from a defeat for the far right in France. Uh, do you think that um, her performance in the French presidential election, it's uh, inspired uh, people from the far right in Germany? No, that's absolutely not the case, because Le Pen showed, especially in the TV debates, how how unable uh, the far right is to really govern a country. When there was a debate about the euro, about the currency, then you had no plan for the future. Mm -hmm. So populists, you can identify them very easy. They have exactly in mind what they don't like, but they have no idea what they like. They have no idea what they want to propose for the future of the countries. And that's why it is, it is, a, it is an endless process. You cannot go this way. It's no, there is no, no, no final result. That's why we have to convince. And what very practically that means that we have to talk about our success stories as well, because sometimes Europe is only talking about problems. Mm -hmm. We have 2% growth rate in the European Union. We have the lowest unemployment rate since 2007, before the crisis. We had finished now the illegal migration to Europe. On Balkan route, in the Mediterranean Sea, we have situation better under control. So it's not everything perfect, but we are solving step-by-step -step problems. And that's why we have to convince these results. Well, we'll come back to the migration issue a little bit later on. Uh, in terms of an outside country that's uh, had quite a lot to say about the election in Germany, uh, we've talked a lot about Turkey. Uh, now, when we spoke to you here on uh, France 24 in 2016, you said that Turkey is an important partner for the EU. Uh, relations, particularly with Germany, but also with the EU as a whole, have been plumbing new depths in recent months. Uh, we can take a look at a report right now that gives us a bit of an overview of where things stand at the moment. Uh, this from Ellen Gainsford. A difficult relationship just got trickier. During a televised debate in the lead-up to the German general elections, Angela Merkel took a tough stance on Turkey's European Union bid. A controversial move, unlikely to please some of the three million people of Turkish background currently living in Germany. It remains to be seen if Turkey still wants to become a member of the European Union. I think this is not the case anymore. Turkey is not like it used to be. Turkey is a big country. We have everything. No matter what they do, Turkey will go on. President Erdogan's spokesperson criticized the debate as populist politics. He says Turkey is being used to divert attention from more pressing issues. We hope that this difficult atmosphere that has worsened relations between Germany and Turkey because of a narrow political vision is going to lessen. Relations between the two countries are increasingly strained. During the campaign for Turkey's constitutional referendum this April, Turkish officials in Germany were banned from holding political rallies, prompting Erdogan to accuse European leaders of using Nazi methods. He's calling for Turks living in Germany to vote against Merkel in the upcoming German elections. Another cause of tension between the two countries is the detention of several Germans in Turkey. Many stand accused of having links with Kurdish groups. But Berlin says they've been arrested for political rather than security reasons. Well, it's not that many years ago that uh, we were talking about Turkey potentially becoming the, the biggest member of the European Union by population, by joining eventually at some point in the next few years. Uh, just recently, Angela Merkel has said she believes that uh, membership talks with Turkey should end. Uh, what's your position? That is a position of the EPP group in the European Parliament. And the whole Parliament, the whole European Parliament, asked several times in the, in the resolutions that we have, at the minimum, to freeze the negotiation talks because everybody sees that Turkey is going in the wrong direction. So enlargement is far, far, far away. We have to be frank to each other in a partnership. Mm -hmm. But me, for me, it's important and for us, it's important not to close the door because that is a conflict that is probably the problem, not to close doors. When we, are, when we are frank to each other, when we say to each other full membership will not work, mm -hmm. then we should add 
an offer. We should also say, yes, we want to talk about trade, we want to talk about exchange of students, we want to talk about visa liberalization. We are ready to do so. If Erdogan comes back to a reasonable behavior, we are ready to do so in the European Parliament. But first of all, we have to be frank, stop the negotiations. Well, human rights issues in Turkey have uh, long been uh, the number one issue that were flagged up uh, as the reason for Turkey not to join the European Union or for things to go slowly. But there was always the counter-argument that talking to Turkey about membership would be the incentive, would be the carrot rather than the stick, uh, to try and get Turkey to change uh, what it was doing. Uh, is that not still an argument? It is an argument, but to use the enlargement talks for this is the wrong uh, point to do mm -hmm. it. The better, uh, the better point is to talk about uh, free trade. We have the customs union, the, the updating of the customs union on the table in the European mm -hmm. Parliament. And we should use this tool for talks about fundamental rights and how you manage your country. Mm -hmm. One thing is important. We can create pressure. We can talk with our Turkish friends. But the main question, do you want to live in a free and a democratic state? That is a question which have the Turks to answer. That is not a question we can impose to them. That is what they have to decide. We can help them, we can assist, but it's up to them to decide in which societies they want to live. All right, well, one issue on which uh, Turkey uh, has very much been in a partnership with the European Union has been on migration. As we know, uh, for a long time, Turkey was uh, one of the major sort of jumping off points uh, for people trying to uh, flee uh, wars in the Middle East, all sorts of issues um, crossing the Aegean to Greece. Now, we know that there was that famous migrant deal uh, with Turkey. However, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières this summer has said that uh, immigration policies aren't working. Uh, people are being trapped, it's a horror story. And in any case, the, uh, the idea of uh, bringing in uh, refugees who've been pre-filtered, it's, it's actually not happening. Uh, isn't this deal a failure? No, it's not a failure. I think it's a, a good, good, uh, good uh, result because, first of all, we stopped that people died in the border region between Greece and Turkey. That mm -hmm. is the main message. And we stopped the business of the mafia, there, of the organized crimes as the smugglers, who earned a lot of money. Together we stopped this, and that is achieve, a big achievement. The second thing is what we did with the agreement was to finance with more than 3 billion euros from European point of view the refugee camps in Turkey. So we guarantee, as an example, we guarantee at the moment the education from the young Syrians in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And it's a big investment, an important investment to avoid radicalization in these camps. So that is the outcome of this agreement. That's why we stick to this agreement. We want to keep it alive. And the Turks for the moment also uh, 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 keep, uh, 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 stick to this agreement. That's why, for me, it's a symbol that these kind of agreements is exactly what we should do. Case by case, finding a a common understanding what is to do to solve our common problems. Not enlargement, not this big question, but case by case. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on a bit deeper into the, the issue of migration itself then. Uh, we do know, as you say, that uh, this transfer of people between Turkey and Greece has drastically slowed. I think we've seen about 120,000 fewer people making that crossing this year than last year. Uh, however, there's also the Mediterranean route, uh, people coming from Libya, people smuggling there is an enormous business. Uh, many people still making that crossing up to Italy, uh, being rescued or, or drowning, as we know. A few weeks ago, I believe you said that the European Union should use an armed threat, NATO patrols, to try to deter those people smugglers. Can you just uh, explain that point of view a bit, bit more for us? Well, again, the main point is uh, that we have to protect our borders. People all over Europe expect this from us. Mm. Uh, and especially the Mediterranean uh, route is a good argument because there we have the proofs and more than 90% of people who are arriving in Europe are not refugees, are not fleeing from a civil war. They are illegal migrants. Mm -hmm. They are not respecting our legislation on migration. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to be clear on this. Yes, to refugees on Syria, for example, when people fleeing from bombs, we have to open the door, we have to help people. But we have to, on the other hand, to respect legal migration law uh, in the European Union to stop illegal migration. That's why uh, that is the main issue. And uh, when you have the capacity and the money the smugglers have in their pocket in mind, uh, they have all the arms, they have all the possibilities to do their business. They're really uh, inhuman business there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why, if it is needed, you have to 
pick up uh, the fight and you have to, to, to show them, like we do it in the fight against the pirates in the, in the, in the, in, in, in the close to Africa, to pick up the arms if needed and fight against them before they do their business, because it's not a fight against mm -hmm. uh, migrants, it's not a fight against migrants, it's a fight against smugglers, against organized crime. Well, indeed, uh, people certainly are taking advantage of these people who are desperate to leave countries. Uh, Eritrea, for example, is one of the countries where many, many thousands of people are fleeing. Uh, however, perhaps we could go even further down this rabbit hole and say that perhaps the solution isn't uh, even tackling the people smugglers. The real solution that will really stop this would be a situation where people aren't wanting to flee Eritrea, Sudan, all of those countries. Uh, that's an enormous, long problem to solve. Uh, and. Can it really be the European Union that can have an impact on that, or at least in, in, in terms of time frame of electoral calendars which suit politicians? Well, in electoral uh, calendars, that's not the time as a framework where we can really solve the problems. But exactly, but that's can, a reality, isn't it? Politicians yeah, like to take measures well, where they can see a result in time to get the votes the next time. Well, those who established the European <laughs> Union uh, we were thinking in long-term perspective. Mm. So there are kind of this, uh, so politicians, but you're totally right. One element is border protection. Second element is we have to open door for real refugees. We have to be, uh, we have to be clear on this. And the third element is we have to invest more in Africa. Mm -hmm. Europe will not have a good future economically and from our democratic principles, freedom and so on, if Africa has not a good future, so our neighbors. That's why we need a the perspective there. And one thing is uh, development aid, and the other aspect is trade policy. Then we can solve the problems. All right, some long-term issues to be looking at there. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that is all we've got time for. Men Fred thank Weber, thanks for being with us here on Talking Europe on a France 24. And do stay tuned. Plenty more news coming up for you. Porque la historia se escribe día a día. Porque la actualidad no espera. La información, donde quiera que esté. En cualquier circunstancia. Todos los temas. Para entender el mundo. Para imaginar el mundo. France 24. Una mirada diferente. A partir del 26 de septiembre en Español.